Well, it really is a privilege for us to be here this evening. It, uh, I, consider, I consider myself and my wife Brenda here to be among friends. Now, it's true that uh, many of your faces, uh, maybe even more than I was sort of expecting, are not readily identifiable, but uh, some of them are. But it is certainly good to be here. I, as we were traveling the last couple of days, a lot of thoughts went through my mind <clears throat> about coming here. And um, one memory I thought I might, or one little anecdote I thought I might share at the beginning is that it was, I'm not sure how long ago, but probably more than 10 years ago. Um, I had a week of meetings in Montezuma, Georgia. And um, the Clearview congregation, and there was an elderly couple there who were, um, her health was failing so that she wasn't there very often, but her husband, Stanley Sullivan, um, he, he was there different times. And Marjorie asked him, so what's this preacher like? And uh, Stanley said, well, he preaches like Glenn Yoder from Rosewood. And you know, I, I took that as sort of a compliment. You see, uh, my father and Glenn are first cousins, were first cousins. And so we got a little, little um, got some relation here, some relatives. It is, um, it's, it's good to be here. I could also talk about, uh, I'm not sure who might be watching from through this medium of technology that isn't seated here with us, but if you're watching Daniel or Carolyn, one of the times that, one, one long memory of someone from Rosewood was when I was a young fellow in about 89, I think in El Salvador. I was, one of, part of my, one of my jobs was to take people around who were there. Well, the AMA delegation came. And at the end of the trip, and, well, I, I, as a young fella, enjoyed the challenge of navigating the traffic just quite a bit. Maybe a little too much, and, uh, but I was taken aside by Brother Daniel and exhorted to maybe be a little bit more circumspect with my navigational skills. <laughs> now, I'm not sure how he said it, but something to that effect. It was very tactful, I can assure you that. But um, anyway... There's other, other stories we could say that would probably be less welcome to some of us here, so I think we'll just leave the rest for now. But it is good to be here. I spoke on this subject at, for a weekend at Calvary Bible School some years ago. And uh, one of the young ladies who was a student at Bible school that weekend came up to me and said, someone I knew pretty well. So she could, she could, anyhow, uh, we could be fairly frank with each other. But she said, you know, Ronald, don't you, that this whole idea of technology and that sort of thing, that's, that's a hot button issue with us young folks. You know that, don't you? And I said, yeah, I think I do. Well, be careful. So, we'll be careful. It was a good weekend. <clears throat> Not quite sure how to introduce or how to title this, this series, but a title that I uh, have chosen, actually used in the past, um, is the discerning disciples digital dilemma the discerning disciples digital dilemma and and i and i chose that and of course we're dealing with our response to the opportunities and pitfalls that are inherent in today's climate now that title assumes that there is an effort, or should be an effort, exercised by the disciple 
to be discerning because a mindless approach is one that follows the path of least resistance and we know where that ends. So we need to be discerning. And of course, as disciples, we want to be uh, disciples of the one who has offered us a hope and a plan and a purpose for that hope. And of course, digital is, well, it starts with D, so it fits pretty well in the title. But digital talks about the, the platform of electronic media that is so prevalent today. So when you talk on the phone, that is a result of, a, of an encryption of code, digital code that is, is, is entered and reprogrammed so that it's an audible voice. And most of our phone communication is that way. And when I use the word, chose the word dilemma, I'm admitting that this is not, this is not one of those things that our approach and our response to media, to technology, to these sorts of things is not a response that is re that it readily gives itself to a slick formula to solve because there are simply difficulties that present themselves and complexities that make us kind of wonder, so what is the best approach? Now, I don't know, um, I, I think that there are some misconceptions, maybe we could say myths or misconceptions related to technology, and I hope I get around to addressing them all throughout this weekend, the ones that I have jotted down, and it's possible my list may grow, especially in my interaction with you all. Maybe you'll think of some. But there are some, I think, some misconceptions related to technology. One of them is that technology is bad, or its twin, technology is good. See, there's more to the equation than a simple up or down vote. Another is technology saves time. Just, to, just for an illustration, how many of you remember a time in your life when, when you go on a trip, there's a big flurry to getting ready to go, and you get everybody and everything packed into the car or the vehicle, you close the road and go down the road, and then it's just, oh, now we can relax. You remember times like that? Hmm, kind of. Is that the way your, your travels go now? Well, maybe they are. Good for you if they do. We left yesterday about noon and we drove part ways and stopped for the night. Came the rest of the way today. And we would have had a very relaxing traveling time if we wouldn't have had quite all the technology with us that we did. But I counted, <clears throat> I just went through the recent calls, and, uh, and I counted um, 48 phone calls since we left home yesterday. And I think about a fourth of those were from outside of the country. You see, there's some problems that they had in, with some documents in, in Belize. And so we, I tried, this morning to find a place to, well, we printed some stuff out, we needed to get it notarized and sent back, and this was, this was all since we left home. And then this afternoon when we were driving on in, Brenda was driving, and that was nice, but this afternoon when we were driving on in, then, then I got a call from someone else who, well, they got to the airport and found out that their COVID test was going to be about two hours too old by the time they landed in Nairobi. So their, free, their, their clear COVID test didn't work after all. So they have to try again some other time. And so there was those sorts of things that needed attention that really didn't contribute so much to a restful journey. 
And it didn't really make me less busy. Now, did it save time? It is true that there are efficiencies gained. I will not argue. We got here a lot faster than if we would have hitched up the horse and wagon. Or if we would have walked. That's technology too, you know. And then some people fly instead of drive. That's faster yet. It has advantages, no doubt. But there are trade-offs. Technology does not make us less busy. It rearranges what we do with the time we have available. Anyway, that's, that's one thing. Another myth is, well, it won't affect me. Another one, it enhances relationships. And we'll talk some more about that, I hope. Or it leads us astray. And I would just, I'm not sure what all I'll have time to say about that, but I would, I'll say about, about that one, what I said about, <clears throat> about uh, in, a, in a gathering, actually it was our regional ministers meeting, we were talking about, so what has the pandemic taught us in our congregations? What are some of the blessings and what are some of the um, non-blessings, shall we say? that it taught us as a congregation. And, and as, you know, one thing I think we should maybe regard as a blessing, please, that that happens. We had a bit of a policy, and I told Laverne that when he called and asked about me coming, that, that when, I, when I go somewhere for meetings, I want the family to go along as much as possible. And our intentions were to bring some of them along. Uh, we have, Lord has blessed us with six children, and we see the 30, our 30th wedding anniversary just sort of peeking at us from across the horizon. Next month, uh, we'll be married 30 years if the Lord tarries. And uh, so the Lord has blessed us with six children. The oldest, Christopher, and his wife, Rachel and Cameron, are serving in El Salvador at Las Delicias, close to where, uh, where um, Lowell and Rhoda have some very keen interests and roots. Um, in fact, they're flying back to Salvador today. As, as we speak, they should be in the air. Uh, Megan is married to Aaron. They have two little boys in our home community. The next one, uh, Melissa, was married to Randall Wagler um, on March the 28th of this year. So they're young married. Uh, interesting set of circumstances there. We counted everybody who showed up at the wedding in their backyard, and there were 21 of us. So it was that time. Um, and then Brianna is still at home. She's 21, and Chadwin is 18, and Ethan is 16. Now, the, especially the boys, we thought were going to come along, but the closer we got, the more complicated it looked to bring them along, and then when the youth group landed on this weekend for their youth, youth retreat. That was sort of a hard one to compete with, but we would have loved to bring them along and had those intentions when we agreed to come, but they aren't here. It's just Brenda and I. I wish I remember exactly what year it was. I'm thinking it was about 2007 the fall, when um, Stan and I, oh, that reminds me, Stan said, I don't know who all to send greetings for, just tell them all hello. <laughs> so greetings from Stan. So Stan and I attended a seminar in Heston, Kansas, and there was a speaker there by the name of Shane Hips. He was a Mennonite pastor from Phoenix, Arizona. And he had written a book. He's written two books now. Uh, one of them is, the one that he had released at that time was called Flickering Pixels. And um, he is also, no, wait a minute, sorry. 
he had, he had released at that point the hidden power of the electronic culture, and then the later version was Flickering Pixels. And if you choose to read one of those books, I would probably recommend Flickering Pixels. I don't endorse everything that Shane Hip says. I think a few things are incomplete, but he does a good job. And actually, a lot of what I'm sharing will come from some of what he wrote. But, um, <clears throat> but he, was a, he was a presenter at the seminar. Some of us were asked to have part in various parts of the, of the weekend as well. But one of the men that he cited uh, fairly extensively in his writing and in his speaking is a man by the name of Marshall McLuhan. I'm just curious, does that name ring a bell with anybody here? Marshall McLuhan, I don't see any hands. Uh, and you will have to bear with me because to lay adequate groundwork for what we want to do this weekend, we're going to have to wade into the weeds just a little bit. And by wading into the weeds, we're going to have to go back in there where it's not so, so, so fun and interesting possibly, but to get, to, to, to try to, to lay the groundwork for what we're doing. Well, Marshall McLuhan was a, was a, a I'm not sure what to call him. He, he was on the cover of Time magazine sometime back in probably the 70s. He was this fella who seemed to speak things way ahead of his time. He wasn't a professing believer. I don't think he was a Christian, but he had an uncanny ability to speak prophetically about things as, um, that, were, that we experience today. So there are a number of phrases that, uh, that few things that I'd like to actually quote from him this evening or this weekend. But one of them is, he said, the medium is the message. Now, what did he mean? The medium is the message. Well, I thought the medium conveys the message. But you know, <clears throat> I think as we, as we sort, of, sort of park there and ponder a little, we at least have to admit that he's more right than I thought he was when I first heard it. So let me illustrate with this. How many of you, no, you don't have to answer, but I'm going to ask a question. How many of you think Christian rock music is appropriate? And I think most of you who say no, it is a contradiction. Say so because you understand that the medium is the message. Maybe I would prefer to rephrase what he said and say the medium is a part of the message. The medium cannot be divorced from the message. And so... <laughs> When we have rock music, sacred, sacred lyrics set to inappropriate music, we, we find that very, uh, that's a dissonance. There's a conflict. There's a, there's a, it doesn't agree. And, 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 and the music then conveys something that the words don't because the medium is involved. Take, for instance, and we, we're using the name medium in a very broad sense. But take, for instance, segregated seating in this congregation here this evening. Now, not all churches use, uh, do segregated seating. Some, of them, some, some congregations sit as families. In fact, ours does. But, <clears throat> but you know what? And there's, a, there's good things that that communicates, okay? I'm not sure that... It is a net gain. One of the things, do you know what it communicates when you seat separate, sit separately this way? It communicates that when you, as God's children, come together as the family of God in, in the church, the emphasis is on the family of God rather than on the nuclear family. It blurs and de-emphasizes the physical family in favor of our oneness in his family. That's, you know, there's, there's other things we could say about it. 
But there, there are things that are communicated by our choices that oftentimes we don't even think of. I think it's good if we describe, if we talk just very briefly yet about the term media. Media. I said the medium is the message. Media is simply the plural of medium. And in a general sense, like I said, medium is a conveyance or a means of transmitting something, whether it's a message or whatever. But in a more, more specific sense, media channels information or a message one way. It doesn't go two ways. We are influenced by media, but not we don't influence media. When you open the newspaper, you're influenced by what you read, but what you read doesn't do anything to what comes to you. It's there. It's a one-way channel. It's that way with your phone. Now, we can exercise certain controls over our consumption by choosing what we consume, but we can't influence that. It influences us. And that's an important thing to remember. Important thing to remember. We're living in a digital age. There have, God, in his wisdom, has provided grace for his children to live faithfully in every context that he has placed his children. But you know, it was a John Stone Street, and I don't know who he was, but he said this. He said, moral values not grounded in truth that transcends one context no longer makes sense when the context changes. And what he, what he was basically saying is, brothers and sisters, we need to have our anchor holding on to something that gives us guidance in the digital age, in, in the pre-digital age, and in the age to come, and we don't know what's going to be next what's going to be next. Now, the title I talked about, I'm sorry, I want to read that, that quote from John Stone Street one more time. Moral values not grounded in truth that transcend or that goes beyond one's context no longer makes sense when the context changes. So we need to be, you know, how long has this thing been here? Think, oh, that's a bad way to talk about the scripture. But how long has the scripture been with us? You know, it was penned across centuries by many, many different authors inspired by one Holy Spirit and the, 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 the canon was closed many centuries ago. But it is relevant for today. It was relevant when it was written. It is relevant for today. That's where we find the truth that goes beyond our context. That makes sense at Rosewood and in Las Delicias in ER and in Cornerstone. Yeah, but you said you forgot. I'm sorry. Cornerstone Mennonite Church is our home congregation in, in Oswego, Kansas. So welcome. Um, but it makes sense wherever you are. That's the scripture. And so we need, to, we need to cultivate an awareness of unchanging principles. Unchanging principles. Discipleship assumes that someone is learning, that something is being learned, that someone is teaching, and that there's a relationship between the teacher and the learner. Those are all components of this, of this idea of discipleship. And so the discerning disciples will find answers for the digital dilemma as he looks to the source. And that is, that is Jesus Christ.
I talked about, the I mentioned the relationship, the fourth ingredient. Someone is learning, something is being learned, someone is teaching, and there is a relationship between the teacher and his disciple. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Just a few comments about those verses. Don't be conformed to this world. Someone has said it this way. Don't allow the world's system and way of thinking to squeeze you into its mold. Don't be conformed. Don't assume the form and shape of a worldling because it wants to exert its pressure on you wherever, however it can. Don't be conformed to this world, but the, the solution is a transformation. Be transformed by the mercies of God. And if I'm not mistaken, that word transform, is where the, the Greek root is metamorpho or something to that effect i'm not a good greek student but that those of you who do uh, biology in grade school recognize maybe the word as being associated with metamorphosis which is a transformation it takes something from it's a pro, it's the process that takes a worm to a butterfly and there's some uh, kind of not so not so beautiful steps there, but the end result is something we all like. That is the transformation that is ours as we, as we present our bodies to let him do what he wants to with us so that we can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that proving, brothers and sisters, isn't as if God's will is on trial and we're proving it or disproving it. It is so that we can know experientially. <clears throat> so that we can prove, we can, we can experience what is his will. Isn't that wonderful? But that is what happens when we as disciples interact with Jesus Christ. Someone has called, <clears throat> if we're talking about communication, if we're talking about relationship, if you're talking about discipleship, someone has called uh, the advent of Jesus Christ, him coming to earth, Emmanuel, God with us, God man. Somebody, somebody, somebody said that is the greatest single communication event in history. Whoever observed that. Because bridging the gap between Almighty God and us, his creation, was a humongous effort in terms of, I mean, the, the gulf is one that we probably won't figure out. We'll maybe understand a little better over yonder than we do now. But, but bridging that gap. And and, you know, God coming to assume the, 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 the form of man in the person of Jesus Christ did nothing to benefit the understanding of an almighty, omnipotent God of us. He knows it all already. It's not like he came down so he could understand us. He came down so that we could know that he understands. And that's communication. So God, as he disciples us, he employs the word, and we could talk about logos, and we could talk about uh, logos is the embodiment or the, the concept, a representation of a larger reality. So when, when Jesus is the word, here is a representation of something that is bigger than what we see. That's logos, the living word. It's also scripture.
So what I would like to do some of the next evenings, and <clears throat> I'm not going to say in conclusion yet because we're not quite concluding, but we're, we're still trying to lay some groundwork. But we would like to answer some of these questions. I said we're going to need to wade into the weeds a little bit, and that will happen tomorrow night, partly. But we're going to need to say, how, well, where did we come from? And how did we get where we are? And where are we? And where do we go from here? So, so by God's grace, as we look at, at charting a faithful course and making a faithful response to the dilemma of the day, I think one of the best ways to do that is to look back at where we've come from. Uh, and, and so that's, that's partly what we, we hope to do. Jim Petrosky said when this idea of technology was being discussed, I think it may have been at Faith Builders, but I'm not even sure where exactly it was. But he said, you know, God's people have, he was just an observation, but I think he's right. He said, God's people often respond to technology, or they, they make choices based on fear. think about that so on the one hand <clears throat> you have people you have people who say we can't go anywhere near anything that smacks of anything that makes us uncomfortable because we're scared of it that's fear and then you have other people who 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 rush to to adopt any sort of technological, permissible technological freedom because they're, they're scared as all get out about leaving, getting, getting left behind. And I, I suppose most of you are kind of giving us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of sound mind. And it isn't... It isn't the choices that are made in reaction to fear that tend to serve God's <coughs> children well or to advance his kingdom particularly. So I, I just, I, I would like to just, I think it's worth mentioning that. Turn with me to James 1, 1 to 8. I noticed that... <clears throat> Just a lot of things that were said this evening in the devotional, things that we sung that I thought of commenting on, and I won't say very much. But one of the things I, I like to just comment very briefly on, <clears throat> Brother Laverne mentioned the message this evening, and I recognize that this topic is one that is, well... I'm not quite sure how to describe it. It's a little, I'm going to say it's a little bit different because you aren't going to this weekend hear what I would prefer in terms of a, of a thorough, um, a thorough expositional treatment of scriptural texts. That, that's the kind of preaching that I kind of prefer. It's going to be a little more topical in nature. And frankly, it's not going to be, I, I want, there is nothing that will be said this weekend that isn't, that is going to be very worthwhile unless it's solidly based on scriptural truth and principle. But largely, I will just tell you this evening in a disclaimer sort of way that this is going to be more topical than expositional. We're not going to be looking at a five-part series on Ephesians 1 and 2. You know, it, it's, we're going to be looking at how we should chart appropriate, uh, how we should, first of all, build an awareness of what's going on here and then make appropriate steps. And I am going to paint with broad strokes because the applications 
are better left to individual congregations and to within congregations to individual families and within families to individual persons. So I would just uh, idealize, frankly, that nobody comes here, first of all, expecting this weekend that Ronald's going to tell you how it's all going to work, but that you work together as a brotherhood and establish minimums, and you do have, I know, but, but you continue that ethic, and then you also realize that, you know, there may be areas that God is calling me, or a position that God is calling me to, that is even maybe not quite as permissive as some of as my brother or the, the congregation has taken, and that's okay too. Faithfulness is really important. So I would like to read, as we talk about faithfulness, James 1, 1 and 8, and make just a few comments. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. A double-minded man is, I'm sorry, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So, I... I think you're a rare person here tonight. If you are sitting here and don't identify with a desire for more wisdom. I, I assume that if I were to ask for a raise of hands, who wishes for more wisdom that we would probably get a pretty good show? I, I, would, I would like to. Well, we've got some... We've got some really helpful comments here for those of us who wish for more wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, what's the, what's the plan? Let him ask of God, who give us to who? All men liberally and upbraid. He doesn't even chide us for asking. Isn't that a blessing? So, we who are his disciples want to be really... Uh, just should rejoice in this provision. God has, has asked, has asked, I'm sorry, God has offered that if this is something we think we need, ask. Another thing I note, so it's maybe a little more sobering, but verse 8 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And you better ask in faith. Because, you know, <laughs> faithless wavering and double-mindedness don't cut it. It's unstable. Don't think you're going to get what you, what you want if you don't have faith. Don't, if you ask for wisdom and you don't think God's going to give it, don't bother expecting that it will either. I mean, it, it, that's just sort of the way, you know, don't let him ask in faith. Uh, but let him ask in faith, nothing waver. For he that waver is like a wave of the sea driven with wind and, and the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Hmm. Be careful. I would like to call our attention yet before we close and we're getting closer, but we're not quite there, to five scriptural principles, five principles from scripture, or five scriptures that give us guiding principles. Maybe that's the way to say it. 
as we relate to technology. And these principles aren't related, aren't, related, aren't limited to technology, but certainly include that. And the first one I would, uh, I, asked, I asked my dad, I said, what? Technology doesn't, isn't talked about much in scripture. What are some things that, what are some things that, uh, what are some basic principles? And this is the one he shared with me. Genesis 1.28 says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And I'm calling this the principle of subduing the creation. Now, we, I hope it will become clear to us as the weekend goes further, if it isn't already, need to simply bow our heads and admit that technology affects us. However, when we lose sight of the fact that we are to subdue the creation rather than the creation subduing us, if we lose sight of that fact, we lose an important reference point as we as we make choices related to technology who's doing the subduing and who is being subdued are we subduing the creation or is it subduing us that's the first one the second one is and I'd like to read in 1 Corinthians 6 12 says this way all things are lawful for me. I'm sorry. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, there is two in that one. The second one was what I read out of, out of Genesis. I will not be brought under the power of any. But the other one is, I'm calling the principle of expediency. So there may be things that actually are legitimate in their place, or legitimate for some. But you know, when I look at the, the sum of the pros and the sum of the cons, uh, it's, it's one that I'm going to put in the, if you, if you speak Pennsylvania Dutch, Put in the Achstild column. Put in the, I'm, I'm, I'm going to avoid that one because it's not expedient. That's the second one, the, the, the principle of expediency. The third one is also from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And it actually sounds fairly similar. It also mentions the principle of expediency, but there's another one. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Oh, there's another one. The principle of edification. Is this the sort of thing that builds what Christ is doing in me? The fourth one is a verse... <clears throat> that uh, is found in 1 Chronicles. It's kind of a passing. There's not much said about these men. But 1 Chronicles 12, 32 reads this way. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. So there were, there were, and we don't read hardly anything about these fellows, but there were 200 of the children of Issachar. But what does it say about them? They knew what Israel ought to do. So I'm guessing that there are going to be some things shared this weekend that you might not have heard of or thought in that way before, and that's okay. And there are things that 
uh, go on in this realm that I'm woefully ignorant of, I'm sure. I'm not saying that all of us need to understand deeply or equally everything about this subject. But, but there need to be people among us who see something of the end of the trend and are able to give godly direction for his people in these times, these difficult times. I think I'm struggling with the reference now, but there's a problem described in one of the Pauline epistles, I believe it is, that talks about spiritual immaturity. And it says, it talks, it mentions two things about are blind and can't see afar off. And there's two different kinds of spiritual blindness. One of them is the, the kind that can't see very far is just pretty short-sighted. It is sort of uh, is present in the here and now without much awareness of what is beyond. But we need people, and there's also spiritual blindness who don't see anything, but we need people who are able to see the end of the trend. Frankly, those kind of folks generally aren't the most popular people at the party, but they need an audience, and they need, they need, a, uh, they need the courtesy of of being listened to. The fifth one, I don't know how to say this one in a very concise way. <clears throat> but the serpent came to Eve in the garden and she and she and he and he said this regarding God's direction not to eat of the forbidden fruit. He said this, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, <clears throat> if you were to describe God, sometimes we talk about his attributes. And I think that's a healthy way to start. Although we don't want to put him in a box that really sort of limits who he is in our mind, although our mind is pretty limited, so maybe it's okay to find some limits. But anyhow, he doesn't really fit in our mind, but we can at least think about him. We can know him, and that's wonderful. But when we think about who God is, he is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. What have you, have, have you ever thought of it? How much the pull of technology mirrors our desire to be like God? You know, Laverne talked about if somebody asked you a question, you can look pretty smart in just a little. Not quite all knowing, but getting closer. And, and I talked about what happened since I left yesterday, since we left home yesterday. All the communication. And, and I was exerting influence and doing work over a much broader area than I was physically in contact. Omnipresence, omniscience. Hmm. Do you think, do you think that is part, part of the seduction of technology on God's people?
And I'm not saying that we shouldn't subdue the technology. And I'm not saying that we should even, well, I'm pretty clearly not saying it because some of the stories I told since, since we left that we should, we should reject all of these things. But a real dose of humility that says, you know, I function best when I operate within human parameters rather than rather than trying to be like God. Now I, I just just want to acknowledge that this is not an open and closed discussion. And there are ways that we are made in the image of God and bear his image that I think also can lend themselves to appropriate use in some cases of this. But brothers, I think it's a little more deceptive than I used to think it was. And one of the things is that we find that, um, I say we, I'm, I'm projecting, some of us. Some of us find it very difficult to be left out of the loop. To find it okay for work, the world to go by and not know what all is happening. Hmm. Do you think that this is something we should pay attention to? I invite you to ponder that. It's an ongoing, ongoing thing for me. I'm going to close now. I talked about that several times, but now I'm serious. I'm going to close with one more quote from Marshall McLuhan. This is relative to his comments that the medium is the message. And it's, it's not quite enough to just close with the quote. I do want to make a few comments about it. But he said this. He said, Our conventional response to all media, namely that it is how they are used that counts. And by the way, I'll just pause there. We generally, I think it's kind of, it's not with everybody, but it's been sort of the, the, the way that conservative Anabaptists have approached media. Generally speaking, saying it depends how it's used, whether it's legitimate or not. Listen to what Marshall McLuhan says about that approach. I'll start over. Our conventional response to all media, namely, that it is how they're used that counts, is the numb stance of the technological idiot. The content of, me of a medium is like the juicy piece of meat carried by the burglar to distract the watchdog of the mind. And what he was saying can be sort of wrapped up in what in, in another quote similar to, I mean, along this line where he said, man makes his tools, then they shape him. But what does he say when he says that, that the content of the medium is like the juicy piece of meat carried by the burglar to distract the watchdog of the mind? So... So, I don't know what your congregation does with motion pictures, with movies. But many, many groups have a, have a, a policy that is largely based on content. But frankly, we can process information at about the speed that you're listening to me speak. And when you when you take in information, a message that is multi-sensory, in where you hear words spoken, you observe actions taken, and sound effects and environment and the whole bit comes, you are, you are, in, you are taking in information much more quickly than you can absorb it. And by the time you have a chance to step away and give that some thought, the message has been implanted. 
So I think it goes to show that it, I mean, it, it's, it's, that is one illustration of the fact that it is more than just the content, but the method of delivery has a profound effect. And um, a friend of mine doesn't live in our community anymore, but Sam Nisley used to live in Belize. And he, <clears throat> some of you know him maybe, but he, uh, he talked about the orange truck on the road to Orange Walk that broke down, loaded full of oranges. And, um, and there were a couple of ne'er-do-wells, I'll say, from the community that were harassing the driver mercilessly and just gave him all kinds of grief and were pestering him. He was, what's going on? In the meantime, the people were emptying the truck in the back as fast as they could. Why? Because he was distracted. He was distracted. And there are ways that the medium reprograms the neural pathways in our brain and changes the way we process information the way that we assess risk, and the way that we assign value. The medium has the ability to do that while we're focusing on the content. Be careful. Be careful. May I just read what Marshall McLuhan said one more time. Our conventional response, and this is, this is probably back in the 70s, way before the internet. Our conventional response to media, to all media, namely that is how they are used that counts, is the numb stance of the technological idiot. The content of a medium is like the juicy piece of meat carried by the burglar to distract the watchdog of the mind. Keep praying. Tomorrow night we'll, we'll go on from here. Bow your heads with me in prayer. Love me, Father. Thank you so much for your creation. Thank you for letting us be your children. Thank you for your provision. And that not only are these times a little mystifying for us, but there are probably ways that we have in the past and maybe continue to now make choices that we have not appropriately contemplated. And so just give us the wisdom and the grace to, to enjoy the blessings of these, of these days. To enjoy your provision for us because we don't, we don't believe that even some of the things that we don't understand and some of the disappointments of the day and the age, some of the dark things of this time, we, we don't believe that those really need to sentence God's children to a life of joylessness, to a life of gloom, to a life of despair. But may it rather sharpen in us an awareness of your eternal provision for us. And even, not just then, but the joy that can be ours as we walk with you today. So I just, um, just commend ourselves to you this evening for your care. And if it please you, Father, bring us all back together tomorrow evening. And uh, may you guide us each step of the way. In Jesus' name. Turn the time back a little bit.